A Mongol army destroyed the city of Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate for almost 500 years in 1258. In that same year, 1200 miles away in a small town of northern Anatolia, a son was born to a minor Turkish prince. That child, Osman, would inherit his father's title, position, and responsibilities as head of his tribe at the age of 23. Before he was 30, Osman would have a dream that changed not just his family's fortunes, but also the history of the Middle East and the world. In this lecture, we're going to revisit Osman's dream, which was nothing less than the creation of a new empire. This empire would take his name, Osman's, or the Ottoman Empire, and its founding would be a turning point in the history of the greater Middle East that would resonate for centuries. In some ways, it still does. Osman's empire would last for more than six centuries before being written into history in the wake of the First World War. This 600-year interval makes it the longest-lasting empire in Middle Eastern history, from the dawn of Islam until the present day. It would eventually conquer Constantinople, ending 1,000 years of Byzantine or Eastern Roman imperial rule. And most modern states of the Middle East that are in existence today were created out of former Ottoman lands. So what was it about Osman and the world around him that allowed him to turn his vision into reality? Many men have harboured imperial visions, delusions of grandeur, if you prefer. So what was it about Osman and the world into which he was born that made his dream come true? Further, how did the Ottoman Empire come into being with its early conquests in Anatolia? And what allowed the new empire to thrive under Osman's son and successor, Orhan, spreading west out of Anatolia into the heartland of the Byzantine Empire and across the Bosphorus into Europe. We'll address each of these questions in this lecture and close with an assessment of the Ottomans in history. The origins of the Ottoman Empire are among the most studied and arguably least understood research areas in the history of Middle Eastern politics and empire. It's well studied because of the importance of the subject. It's among the least understood because there aren't as many sources of information available to us as historians would like. What we can say with certainty is that there were some external and some internal reasons why the Ottomans were able to establish their dynasty. External reasons include the decline of the Byzantine Empire to the west and the rise of the Mongol Empire to the east. As I indicated at the outset, in the very year that Osman was born, a Mongol horde laid waste to Baghdad, the capital of the Abbasid Caliphs. The speed with which the Mongol Empire spread from 1206 until its peak 70 years later was staggering, shocking, and disruptive on a scale unlike the emergence of any empire before or since. Apart from the millions killed, many more, entire ethnic groups in some cases, were displaced. Moving out of their ancestral homelands, searching for safety and new lands, they of course came into contact with other people already living there. And this was the case in Anatolia. Also known as Asia Minor, Anatolia is the peninsula landmass that's roughly contiguous with modern Turkey and some adjoining areas. Throughout the 13th century, existing Turkic powers in Anatolia were destroyed or severely weakened while others were displaced. Today, we can look at the Ottomans 600 years and see three common threads that both contributed to its strength and which remain central to Ottoman identity. One, adherence to Sunni Islam. Two, allegiance to the imperial dynasty. And three, dominance by a Turkish-speaking elite and a power base located where Europe and Asia meet, in and around the Black, Aegean and Mediterranean seas.
when Osman's family migrated to Anatolia from the area of modern Turkmenistan, the Seljuk Turks allowed them to settle in a northwestern corner. According to one tradition, Osman came to Anatolia with 400 horsemen and with the expressed intention of fighting the Byzantines on behalf of the Anatolia-based Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. Now, the rum in that name isn't the drink. It means Rome, or the lands once held by Rome, which tells us that the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum had been carved out of former Eastern Roman or Byzantine territory. But where did the Seljuks come from in the first place? The Seljuk Turks originated from an area around the Aral Sea, a fast disappearing body of water that straddles the border between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan in Central Asia. Like many Turkic tribes, the Seljuks were nomadic and they drifted into Anatolia, establishing an empire there in the middle of the 11th century. The Seljuks invaded Byzantine portions of Anatolia in 1068 and quickly annexed large portions of the peninsula. Three years later, in 1071, the Seljuks dealt the Byzantines a devastating blow at the Battle of Manzikert in eastern Anatolia, a victory that effectively neutralized further Byzantine resistance to Seljuk conquests and subsequent Turkification of Anatolia. While the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum secured and expanded its Anatolian holdings, the Seljuk days were numbered by the time we come to the rise of the Ottomans, and there are two reasons for this. Firstly, by the 1240s, the Seljuks were fighting a series of losing battles against the emerging power of the Mongol Empire. And secondly, their vassals and sometime allies in Anatolia took advantage of the disruption caused by the Mongol threat by breaking free of Seljuk control. By 1294, when the Mongol leader Kublai Khan died, the Mongols had split into four realms. Each one of these was ruled by a different descendant of the legendary Genghis Khan. And Anatolia consisted of dozens of small, independent or semi-independent principalities, beyliks in Turkish, after the Turkish word for prince, bey, spelt B-E-Y. All of which brings us to Osman Bey, Prince Osman. After inheriting his father's title, Osman was staying one night with a family friend and prominent Muslim religious authority, Sheikh Edebali. Osman's pleas to let him marry the Sheikh's daughter had been rebuffed by the older man. But this night, after falling asleep, we're told that Osman had the following dream. Now, as this is the central foundational myth of the Ottoman Empire, it's worth hearing in some detail. In his dream, Osman saw himself and Sheikh Edebali next to each other. Suddenly, a full moon emerged from the Sheikh's chest, rose into the sky, and then descended into Osman's own chest before disappearing. This was followed by the appearance of a beautiful tree, which kept growing larger and stronger and more beautiful. The tree grew so large that its shade stretched far to the horizon in three directions. Under the tree, four mountain ranges arose. The Caucasus in Eurasia, the Atlas in North Africa, the Taurus in Anatolia, and the Balkans in Europe. Then Osman saw four rivers sprouting from the base of the tree, namely the Tigris, Euphrates, Danube, and Nile. After this, he envisioned plentiful harvests and traders coming in ships from all corners of the earth. And then the leaves on the tree turned into swords, which were blown by a mighty wind until they all pointed towards Constantinople. This great city, lying between two seas and two continents, looked to Osman like a diamond set between two sapphires and two emeralds. It formed the most precious stone in a ring that would be a global empire. 
And just as Osman was about to put the ring on his finger, he woke up. Osman asked the Sheikh what his dream meant, to which the religious elder replied, God Almighty has bestowed sovereignty upon you and your generation. My daughter will be your wife, and the whole world will be under the protection of your children. Now, every country has its founding myths, and the story of Osman's dream is as good as any. However, there's something we should add. Religious figures, such as Sheikh Edebali, had an important role in granting legitimacy to princes and kings. Even if a sovereign were God's choice, they'd still benefit from a religious blessing. And as the empire grew, there's no doubt this approval helped enormously. As the ruler of a Beylik or principality, Osman Bey was under the authority of the Seljuk Sultanate of Rum. But having once dominated central and eastern Anatolia, the Sultanate was now militarily and politically weak. On the 27th of July, 1299, Osman declared his independence, and just like that, an empire was born, or at least declared it was open for business. As his dream made clear, Osman believed that fate, or kismet in Turkish, had ordained him to found an empire that would grow into the greatest power on earth. Now, it's one thing to declare your independence from a powerless master, but it's quite another to go on the offensive and to start building up an empire of your own. In this, Osman was fortunate on two counts. One, that the Mongols were so strong, and two, that the Byzantine Empire was indeed so weak. Many Muslim Turkic tribes pushed west across Anatolia. These Turkic tribesmen, having been forced from their homelands by the Mongol invasions, were now searching for two things. The farmers among them needed land on which to settle, including pastures for their livestock. In turn, the warrior class was looking for a renewed sense of personal pride and honour. The Ottoman Empire could offer both. These Ghazis, or religious warriors, would jump at the chance to prove themselves in battle. Anatolia's border with the Byzantine Empire wasn't a fixed line, but instead was fought over on a regular basis and shifted as a result. But it did abut Osman's principality. So the young, energetic founder of this new empire declared a holy war against the declining Christian power next door. It's impossible to say just how religious in intent were Osman's attacks against the Byzantine Empire. My guess is that his drive for territory and power were far stronger pulls than was religion. But by calling Byzantium a religious objective, he could appeal to warriors who might otherwise not have fought for him. And as we've seen, local religious authorities also supported the religious flavour of his ambitions. The Ghazi warriors, believing they were fighting for the defence or expansion of Islam, showed themselves to be very effective. For the rest of his life, Osman engaged in an almost incessant warfare along the border with Byzantium. It's worth pointing out that Osman's name, Uthman in Arabic, means bone breaker. How fitting. But not all of Osman's victories were gained in combat. Many Byzantine settlements, alarmed by the rise of this Muslim Turkish warrior king on their borders, were abandoned without a fight. Local populations moved west, first to the Anatolian coast and then to Europe. As a result, Osman quickly won the support of many, though by no means all, of his Anatolian neighbours. Through a series of pacts and treaties, those Turkic tribes that agreed to be folded into the nascent Ottoman Empire were promised a fair share of an ever-increasing booty. We see one very interesting sign of Osman's growing power in the 1320s. Osman was the first Turkish ruler 
to mint coins in his own name, which in Islamic practice of the day was a privilege reserved for kings. These coins bear the legend, minted by Osman, son of Ertugul, and tell us much of what we need to know about Osman's growing confidence and view of himself, from prince to king. In addition, Osman was a keen promoter of marriages between members of his tribe and other local powers, which was another effective means of increasing the size and power of his domains. The Turkic tribe's common ethnic heritage, language, and broad tribal customs also made a big difference. While this became a different matter as his empire spread overseas, Osman didn't initially have to worry too much about fractious minorities in his midst. In his 25-year reign, from independence in 1299 until his death in 1324, Osman enjoyed a number of military gains against the Byzantine Empire in Anatolia, where the doomed rump of a now ancient empire still held on in places along the coast of western and northwestern Anatolia. In the process, he encouraged ever greater numbers of Ghazi, or religiously inspired warriors, to join his cause. This, in turn, spread fear among the Byzantines and excitement among his followers. For all his military successes, Osman didn't manage to set up the formal framework required to support a new state and growing empire. On his deathbed, Osman spoke to his son Orhan to advise the younger man about how best to proceed. We are made to understand that he said, Son, be careful about religious matters before all other duties. Religious precepts build a strong state, so do not give religious duties to careless, faithless, and sinful men. Nor should you leave the business of running the state to such men, but to God-fearing men, because the one who fears God has no fear of other men. The father's words of wisdom concluded as follows. Scholars, virtuous men, artists and writers are the power of the state structure. Treat them with kindness and honour. Build close relationships when you hear about a virtuous man and give him wealth and power. Before we continue with the story of the Ottoman Empire's early days, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes thinking about the role of religion in this new political realm. As I mentioned earlier, one central unifier during the Ottoman Empire's 600-year span of common identity and success was the adherence to Sunni Islam. As we've just seen, Osman on his deathbed advised his son and heir, Orhan, to be careful about religious matters, in part because religious precepts build a strong state. That's one reason that Islam was central to the Ottoman Empire. Starting with Osman, the earliest Ottoman sultans made numerous appeals in the name of the Islamic faith. While the new empire was growing, these calls for help were directed at Muslims who might become allies to fight alongside the Ottomans against the Christian Byzantine Empire. However, even a quick look at the available evidence shows that such pleas were designed purely to get much needed military support, rather than Islam being the central or driving force behind their campaigns. Instead, what we're seeing were essentially imperial conquests of the everyday common or garden variety, with an appeal to religious faith tacked on to win important support. As the Ottoman Empire expanded, the possibility of Islam providing legitimacy for the reigning sultan became increasingly important, especially as the Ottomans invaded and conquered countries that already had Muslim-majority populations. The high tide of that expectation came in 1517. In that year, the Ottoman Sultan Selim I, also known as Selim the Grim, conquered Islam's two holiest cities, Mecca and Medina. 
and he almost immediately declared himself caliph, or Muhammad's successor. In this way, Selim and all subsequent Ottoman sultans were putting themselves at the head of the Sunni Muslim faithful. But even before then, the Ottoman leadership had sought political legitimacy in other ways. Keen sponsors of Islamic institutions, for example charities, schools and mosques, they also introduced and promoted more formal control over a Sunni judicial system across their realm. This was important in weeding out heresies, mainly the potential threat from Shia political challengers, and also in establishing firm control over all Ottoman subjects. This last point is especially worth noting because in the Balkans and other parts of Europe, the Muslim Ottomans were ruling over Christian majority populations. There's one last point I'm going to highlight regarding Islam and political legitimacy in the Ottoman Empire. And it's something that, in the span of history, no previous caliphate had to think about. As we know, according to Islamic tradition, Muhammad, said to be the last of the prophets, had received a series of revelations from the angel Gabriel. These revelations were the foundation stone of the Quran, and so Islam itself. The important point here is that God chose to make those revelations in Arabic. So while Islam was said to be a universal message for all humankind, as the language used to transmit that message, Arabic was understood to be a sacred language, the language of God. But the Ottomans were a Turkic people who spoke a Turkic language, which is another reason they were so assiduous about promoting and supporting Sunni Islam. So even as Ottoman Turkish was used for Ottoman court documents, Arabic retained a central place as the language of revelation, the language of Islam. Of course, this situation is not dissimilar to the role of Latin in Western Christendom. But now let's return to Osman and the first of his successors. When Osman died at the age of 66 in 1324, his son Orhan succeeded him. And so the all-important task of state formation was left up to the younger man, as was the business of further conquests. As the new Ottoman leader, Orhan's first major achievement was to complete the siege and conquest of the city of Bursa in northwestern Anatolia. Accounts differ, as they always do, but Osman's forces had commenced their attack on the city either six or nine years before he died. Some writers say Osman passed away before Bursa fell. Others claim that he was told about the city's capture as he lay on his deathbed. Either way, the long siege indicates the inexperience of the Turkic nomads-come-warriors, pastoralists, when it came to tackling defensive walls that were a central part of more established city-based empires. Orhan marked Bursa's capture by making it the Ottoman Empire's first official capital. By 1345, the Ottomans had conquered other important cities in Anatolia as well, including Nicaea, second city of the Byzantine Empire after Constantinople. By this stage, the Byzantine Empire had given up trying to retake lost territories in Anatolia. Sidestepping Constantinople, Orhan shifted his imperial aims to Europe via Gallipoli in 1345. From there, he and thousands more Ghazi warriors pushed west into the Balkans, eventually leaving the Byzantine capital surrounded by a rump state in eastern Thrace, which today marks the European bits of Turkey. Ottoman conquests in the Balkans would lead to centuries of Muslim rule in Eastern Europe. Rather than viewing these centuries as a period of constant tension and conflict, many historians, 
refer to it as the Ottoman peace, the Pax Ottomana. After their initial conquests, Ottoman rule is seen by many as a long period of stability, which replaced the insecurity of a dwindling Byzantium under attack not just from Anatolia, but also from ambitious Western Christian states, great and small. As the Ottoman Empire grew, so too did the need for better order and organization. Under Orhan, a professional standing army of both infantry and cavalry was established. Another century would pass before a non-Ottoman European power established a standing army of its own. Orhan also introduced the institution of the Janissaries. The word Janissary is Turkish for new soldier. Such units consisted of male Christian youths taken as slaves from lands the Ottomans conquered. Removed from their families and converted to Islam, these boys grew up together, receiving military training from their Ottoman masters. The Janissaries developed a sense of devotion to each other and to the Ottoman state. Nor were they limited to the role of foot soldiers. In time, they rose to the highest ranks of Ottoman administration, including that of the Grand Vizier, or Sultan's senior advisor. Now, after years of conquests, Orhan increasingly turned his hand to administering his empire. In the process, he established those organs necessary in a well-run, functioning state. Orhan seems to have been a natural-born administrator. At the same time, he benefited greatly from the disarray affecting not just eastern Anatolia, but other parts of the Muslim world. This wasn't just political disorder either, but the outbreak of the Black Death pandemic, which reached the Middle East and Europe at almost the same time in 1347, and which was to have a devastating impact on the region for years to come. Administrators, merchants, scholars and artisans all made their way to his domains, and he put their skills to very good use. It's important to take into consideration that the decline of the Byzantine Empire was a regionally destabilizing development that benefited the nascent Ottoman Empire. To complete the picture of talents of the earliest Ottoman rulers, we should mention in passing the achievements of Orhan's own son, Murad I. Known as Murad Hudavendigar, or the godlike one, it was during Murad's reign that still more of the Balkans were brought more firmly under Ottoman control. Murad brought the princes of northern Serbia and Bulgaria into submission, and also forced the Byzantine emperor, John V Paleogolus, to pay him tribute. Murad then divided the Ottoman Empire into two provinces, Anatolia and the Balkans. This made the job of ruling easier, as did his choice of capital city. At an unknown date in the 1360s, troops loyal to Murad took the Byzantine city of Adrianople, which was renamed Edirne, and became the Ottoman Empire's new administrative and political center. More importantly, its location, just 150 miles west of Constantinople, placed it firmly in Europe. Thus, Murad's choice of a capital sent a clear signal to the world about how he saw the future of this empire, and it wouldn't be lurking in Anatolia. Although Murad died in 1389, Edirne remained the Ottoman capital for just under a century. One of Murad's successors, the Ottoman Sultan Mehmed II, or Mehmed the Conqueror, defeated Constantinople in 1453, bringing about the final collapse of the Byzantine Empire. Mehmed then moved the Ottomans' capital to the former Byzantine center, where he consolidated power. As I mentioned early on, the founding of Osman's empire in 1299 marked the start of 600 years of rule in the greater Middle East by non-Arabic former nomads. 
the early Ottoman conquests in Anatolia and in the Balkans foretold the long-term potential of the latest burgeoning Islamic empire. Able to make quick gains against the aged and ailing Byzantine empire next door, the Ottomans secured these and later advances by quickly establishing the vital organs of state, including a well-organized bureaucracy and a strong army. And the later expansion of the empire beyond Anatolia and Eastern Europe, across the wider Middle East and North Africa, saw the Ottomans become a transcontinental superpower. A central tenet of their broader imperial control was the use of Islam as a political and social tool. Osman, Orhan and Murad, the first three heads of the Ottoman state, father, son and grandson, ruled for a combined 89 years between them, creating a climate of stability and growth. And just to think, it all started with a dream.